Hello, my name is Gavin and this is Genre Books and April has been the first month of a two-month reading event called Spring Into Adventure. Now, I like my pulp magazines and pulp magazines did a lot of adventures. And then I thought, pulp magazines, adventures, adventures, pulp magazines. And in under half an hour, I decided to do a video about a pulp adventure magazine. There are plenty to choose from. Very early pulp magazines and some slicks have very heavy adventure elements to them. Magazines like Ainsley's, Smith's, Muncie's, All Story, All Story, I believe, first printed Tarzan. New Story magazine also printed Edgar Rice Burroughs, uh, Beyond 30 is a novel of his that they serialised and within the same year they'd also printed Edgar Wallace and H. Ryder Haggard both names which have certainly cropped up so far in this Spring Into Adventure People's Magazine, another early pulp included the H. Bedford Jones, John Solomon Adventures they also first published The Grey Seal the first millionaire playboy vigilante whether he was quite a millionaire back in the 1910s whether he had to have been i'm not sure nonetheless this character is the precursor to the shadow and the spider therefore this is also the precursor to batman and we don't get much more action than superheroes. Street and Smith, the publishers who owned People's Magazine, merged it with Complete Stories magazine, and this magazine is one of the first to publish Robert E. Howard. Street and Smith also owns titles such as Sea Stories, Excitement, Far East Adventure Stories. Top Notch magazine began its life in 1910 as a weekly sports periodical for boys, but this morphs into an adventure pulp and by 1920 they are publishing Earl Stanley Gardner mystery stories in 1930 they also published the first Lester Dent stories who goes on to write the Doc Savage series or a fair chunk of it Robert E Howard pops up in this magazine as well and also another writer new on the scene L Ron Hubbard the Ridgeway company owned everybody's magazine and adventure. These are titles that would print or reprint. Jack London, Talbot Mundy, Victor Rousseau, established and serious publishers like Harper and Brothers wanted a piece of this action as well, if nothing else than to create digest size advertisements for their portfolio of novels. And their magazine, Brief Stories, includes the first stories by Dashiell Hammett, who was writing as John Collinson, and Hugh B. Cave. The publisher, William Clayton, produced Ace High, which was technically an adventure pulp, but had a very strong Western story bent. But they also produced Danger Trail and Soldiers of Fortune. Fiction House, the publisher of my chosen current deep dive project, Planet Stories, produced action stories a pulp that ran for three decades and there's that man robert e howard again this time with his breckenridge elkins stories metropolitan magazines incorporated the people that gave us thrilling wonder stories also give us thrilling adventures this magazine is the first to print louis l'amour who oddly enough isn't writing westerns for them he's writing high seas adventure there are similar gems to be found in other titles of the era five novels monthly triple x uh, the golden fleece or just golden fleece i was very tempted to do this particular episode on an issue of golden fleece 
this is a short-lived magazine, but one that gave us stories by E. Hoffman Price, L. Sprague de Camp, H. Bedford Jones, Johnston McCulley. The final choice for a magazine to do an in-depth look at is necessarily arbitrary. With over half a century of adventure stories printed in pulps, there is not one platonic ideal there is not a, just a prime example of what an adventure magazine looks like but i think with this issue of magic carpet from january 1934 we have that mix which i think defines adventure in these magazines and that is stories of action stories of mystery stories of romance and stories of exotic locales. Magic Carpet was produced by a popular fiction company, the same people behind Weird Tales. And although there were only five issues under the Magic Carpet name, the magazine was previously called Oriental Tales, you'll see that the writers in this issue are familiar names if you're a Weird Tales reader. In fact, the cover of this issue of Magic Carpet is by Margaret Brundage, who is a name familiar to anyone with a passing familiarity with weird tales. Although the cover here is remarkably tame by weird tales standards. The cover story here is Speed Planes for Moscow by S. Gordon Gerwitt. Samuel Gordon Gerwitt was born in New York in 1887 and died in 1955 in Miami. He was a newspaper reporter, a cartoonist, a poet, playwright, screenwriter, painter and pianist. In 1910 he's working as a cartoonist in Chicago and begins writing within the next decade for Parisian Monthly Magazine, a story called The Harder They Fall, and uh, followed that up with um, a story in the Breezy Stories, a poem in the Snappy Stories, and a mystery story, The Ghost plays a hand in Weird Tales in 1933. As well as those titles, he writes for Astounding Stories, Secret Agent X, Argosy, and Five Novels Monthly. Speed Planes for Moscow is the tale of um, in engineers from all over the world employed by, drawn to, the Soviet Union to create, as part of one of Stalin's five-year plans, new technology such as very fast aeroplanes. By the time this story is printed, Stalin's only been in charge for 12 years, but some stories about the behaviour must already have got out because even in this fictionalised setting, he is here really cracking down on the workers in this factory and a number of them finding themselves disappeared or executed. This story is about the... Uh, burgeoning romance between an American plain designer and his Russian interpreter. He wants to marry her, and you know that doesn't go down well with the authorities. The second story is The Rivers of Perfume by Warren Hastings Miller. Miller was born in 1878 and died in 1960. He was the editor for some years of the magazine Field and Stream and was, by all accounts, a very outdoorsy man. Not averse to a bit of adventure himself, he was in the Navy in both the Spanish-American War and the First World War. He wrote for Boy's Life and American Boy. He held a patent on a particular design of Woodsman's Tent. And he managed to find the time to write 32 books, whether these were guides to the outdoors, whether these were boys' own adventures about trips to Borneo, and annoyingly, having just missed uh, Giant April, I found out he also wrote a book about ape men in Sumatra. In what must have been quite limited spare time, he also found the opportunity to write for pulp magazines. And for his pulp stories, he seemed to have a, a strength or penchant for writing about the Far East. So Magic Carpet, previously Oriental Stories, was a good fit. The Rivers of Perfume is the story of an American doctor in Indochina 
who is assisting reluctantly uh, one of the pretenders to the local throne to help kidnap a beautiful young lady. He's in a position to help because he is a physician with a specialism in treating snake bites. And the idea is to have this poor woman bitten, get near death, have him save her and whisk her away. This all goes well until the point he falls for the girl himself. The next story is Alleys of Darkness by Patrick Irvin, a tale in the Dennis Dorgan series. Patrick Irvin is a pseudonym for Robert E. Howard. I don't think I need to tell anybody about Robert D. Howard, and if people do need telling about Robert D. Howard, there are much better introductions to the man and his work on other channels, notably the biggest Robert E. Howard cheerleader on the internet, Michael K. Vaughan. And I will link at least one of his Robert E. Howard videos below. Dorgan is a prize fighter and a sailor, but he's a sailor who finds himself without a ship when a fight he definitely won is declared for the other competitor. He's caught up then in a series of betrayals and misdirections which is 75% fist fighting and all the better for it. The highlight of this magazine is The Shadow of the Vulture by, you guessed it, Robert E. Howard. This is a historical adventure and that puzzled me because this is also the first appearance in print of Red Sonia. But Red Sonia is here, Sonia, S-O-N-Y-A, not Sonia, S-O-N-J-A, which is the Conan Universe Sonia. But the Conan Universe Sonia was created by Marvel after the success of the Conan the Barbarian comics. Sonia here shares many of the attributes and characteristics of Red Sonia from the comics and the films, but she has a completely different background here and is as happy with a pistol as she is with an axe. But this is a tale of the vindictiveness with which Suleiman the Great, Sultan of Turkey, persecuted his war in Austria. And this is culminating in the Siege of Vienna. For a long short story, this fairly zips along. And you know, what can I say about Robert E. Howard that hasn't been said elsewhere? But we have a complete change of pace with the next story, Five Merchants Who Met in a Tea House by Frank Owen. This is much more a hangover from the uh, the Oriental side of the magazine and is written in more of a mor morality tale or parable um, than it is an adventure story. This type of story is typical of Frank Owen who wrote mannered pieces about the Orient, but it does find the time and space to leave a, a little bit of 1930s Western misogyny in there as well. Frank Owen was born in 1893 and died in 1968. He also wrote as Richard Kent and as, uh, what's the name, Roswell Williams. He also wrote children's stories alongside his elder sister, Ethel Owen. Novels were produced under the name Roswell Williams, stories under his own name in the magazines, and poems in the magazines with a odd byline, Hung Long Tom. One of these short poems is in this issue of the magazine. It's fine, but haiku don't have verses. The next story is by a writer called Arthur Morris Crosby, who I could find no other information about. I could find no other stories by him either. Although he, there is a man of the same name who lived in Nantucket. He's not that man from Nantucket. He's another man from Nantucket who was a painter and had dates that would be contemporaneous um, with certainly the other writers of this issue, roughly. Whether it's him, I can't say. I'd have to do some more digging. 
this is an enjoyable piece. It's set in France and apart from anything shows that these writers could be as stereotypical about Europeans as they can people of other races, which I suppose is refreshing to see. It tells a story of an escaped convict who returns to Paris to find that his girlfriend has set up with another fella and it proceeds to show what he does about it. But we move on from the little affair of the Eiffel Tower to adventure in North Africa for G.G. Pendarves, A Passport to the Desert. G.G. Pendarves is the pseudonym of Gladys Gordon or Gladys Gordon Trinary, born in 1885, died in 1938, an English novelist and screenwriter for silent movies. She also wrote under the pseudonym uh, Marjorie E. Lamb, and I believe it's under this pseudonym that she first writes for Weird Tales. And she is one of the top women contributors to Weird Tales. And it's not until her last three stories are published posthumously in 1939 in Weird Tales that the editor reveals who the writer actually was. This is an enjoyable tale of slavery and betrayal in Algeria and the consequences of doing a good deed. Seabury Quinn wrote the next story, which is called The Spider Woman, which is a Carlos the Tiger story. Much more famous for his um, Jules de Grandin cult detective, Seabury Quinn was a mainstay of Weird Tales and therefore unsurprising to see him in this magazine. The Carlos the Tiger stories seem to be popular and I think it was probably nice for the readers to see a different side to Quinn rather than the you know the the occult and the ghostly stories that they had seen to this point not that Seabree Quinn was averse to a little bit of the dark side of life in his real life Seabury Grandin Quinn was born in 1889 died in 1969 he was a lawyer specializing in mortuary jurisprudence and lectured on <laughs> the various legal aspects of mortuaries and embalming he was also the editor of i can't believe this magazine is real the trade magazine of embalmers in america casket and sunnyside to this point the seabury quinn i've read has just been stories that i've enjoyed i hadn't actually looked into the gentleman until this point and that took a very definite left turn. Then in the magazine there follows a couple of poems, um, a note from the editor, with some very edited highlights of some letters that people have sent in, and a little response form, trying to get some feedback about what people were liking and what they weren't liking. There are also, I just want to say before I come to the last story, some crazy adverts in this magazine and this probably isn't that much of a surprise to anyone who's read a pulp magazine but there was a lot of unleashing the power of the mind here i am going to see if i can find one of these books one day it's got to be about as much use as the self-help books that we have around these days still to the last story james w bennett another writer that I couldn't find a lot about and this is a very slight coda to the magazine it's a story that is spread out over a number of pages interspersed with adverts there's not the same focus on this but I don't know whether that is just to pad out what is a very short sketch it's enjoyable enough but it's fairly flimsy and trite however on the whole this magazine does exactly what it's supposed to for an adventure magazine it gives you the action the romance the novelty or foreign locale some historical daring do violence murder a little bit of sex and what a glorious package i think i may have to start seeing about reading some more adventure pulps it's nice to have a variety 
of tales to dip into rather than reading purely science fiction or horror or western it's just a little smorgasbord of pulp loveliness having said that normal service of the planet stories variety will resume in the next pulp episode until that point bye